Why are we using the word Palestinian? There's no such thing as a Palestinian person. We use the word settlement. There's no such thing as settlements. They're Jewish homes. New anti-Semitism is continuing day in and day out in the UN. And only today we have heard the news in our mission I submitted my name to be the chairman of the Sixth Committee of the UN as a representative of the WIOG group in the UN. It's a group of Western European countries. And today we got a letter. We got a letter from the ambassador of Iran <laughs> where he's writing to us why Israel cannot be a head of a committee at the United Nations. And he explains that it is unacceptable that the ambassador of Israel will head a committee at the UN because of, you know, all the things that we are doing in Israel. In Hebrew, we say chutzpah. In English, we say chutzpah. This is a chutzpah to come and say to us that we cannot represent, we cannot chair a committee at the UN, and Bedrat Hashem, we will overcome this challenge and this obstacle. The purpose of my talk here is really to empower, to talk about how we can use the legal and legislative system not to defeat BDS, but to uphold our basic civil rights. And I'd like to speak about the BDS movement as one that, w in the terminology that millennials will understand, which is the civil rights terminology, okay? We should stop giving so much credit, as Malcolm said, to the BDS movement. Frank Luntz's poll said 70% of Americans don't know what BDS stands for. Why are we hosting conferences, putting BDS out there in the media and giving them free publicity? There's no reason for us to do that. We should be holding conferences on Islamist terrorism, theologically motivated terrorism, and the evils of it. And we should be holding conferences on the basic civil rights of the Jewish people because we have the most incredible narrative. We have the Zionist narrative. I mean, think about what's been appropriated. You have an indigenous community that's been expelled from its land, subject to occupation, subject to genocide, subject to apartheid. Does that sound familiar? That is our narrative. And the reason why that they appropriate our narrative is because it is so powerful. So the reason why I do what I do today, I actually originally never wanted to go into human rights law. I ended up graduating Cardozo. I studied entertainment law. I did my uh, uh, stints. At, I worked for InStyle Magazine, Time Magazine. I did all the fancy stuff. And I ended up producing a documentary film called The Making of a Martyr. Uh, over two years of my life, uh, I risked my life. I interviewed leaders of terrorist organizations, Hamas, Al-Aqsa, Islamic Jihad. Um, I did so to expose what I thought was one of the greatest crimes against humanity, which is the illegal indoctrination and recruitment of innocent Muslim children towards violence. I ended up, uh, unbeknownst uh, to me, totally unintentionally doing very well with the film. And as I ended up touring the film in film festivals and going on media, I was talking about Islamist terrorism and the evils and the danger that uh, it poses not just to Israel but all Western democracies. And I noticed that everybody who was doing what I was doing, which is speaking publicly about this threat, either started getting slandered as an Islamophobe or found themselves on the receiving end of a frivolous lawsuit. And then I looked around at what was happening to campuses, you know, on students on campus, I don't have to repeat it, rampant violations of basic civil rights, rampant violations of the Title VI guarantees, rampant violation of the constitutional rights to freedom of assembly and First Amendment, which we'll get into later. And I said, you know what I want to do? I want to work for the pro-Israel Legal Fund. There are so many Jews, Jewish lawyers, you know, there, surely there has to be a pro-Israel legal organization. There has to be a litigation fund. The Muslims have their litigation fund. The Council on American Islamic Relations has thousands of dollars. They engage in lawfare. The Muslim Legal Fund for America. Do you have J. Seculo? You have the Evangelical Legal Funds. You have Atheist Legal Funds. You have the ACLU. Where is the pro-Israel legal fund? There wasn't any. So in 2010, I heard Malcolm Holmline speak for the first time. I was incredibly moved. 
I ended up meeting with him, and he helped me, and the Conference of Presidents helped establish the first ever pro-Israel civil rights litigation fund for the Jewish community, which I direct now. And our goal is not to be on the defensive, but to engage on the offensive. The, dis the goal is to make the enemy pay to hold them accountable and to send a message, a deterrent message, that similar actions such as those that they engage in will result in massive punishments. And we've had some incredible successes. But before I go into that, I want to also mention one thing that's incredibly important. We keep talking about the BDS movement as though it's some sort of standalone entity, when the reality is it's a very uh, top-down, hierarchical, uh, uh, directed, um, systemic, systematic um, entity that is, you know, governed not just by the Arab League and, and, and supported by the Palestinian Authority, but it is not grassroots, and it stems from a larger uh, atmosphere of what we call lawfare, the use of the law as a weapon of war. So what do I mean by that? When you have dozens of war crimes charges filed against Israeli officials in Spain, in Belgium, in Canada, in Switzerland, and so on. And yet Hamas and Hezbollah are free to cross European borders with impunity, and yet Israeli officials are afraid of an Interpol arrest warrant when they land in Europe. That is not justice. That is what we call lawfare, the use of the law as a weapon of war to delegitimize the ability of democracies to engage in battle, to engage in an asymmetric battlefield. When you have an international court of justice issue an advisory opinion declaring that Israel's security fronts brick and mortar is a violation of international law, and the same justices refuse to hear the witness, the testimony of, of terror victims, and refuse to enter into evidence the very relevant fact that the fence contributed to a sharp decline in the loss of human lives, refused to enter that into evidence as they deliberated, that is not due process. That is not justice. That is lawfare. When you have the United Nations redefine the concept of a state, you can go to a blacks law dictionary and you can see that the basic elements including defined borders are not met and yet you have the united nations redefining the word state in international law that is lawfare and that is what the bds movement feeds off of this this delegitimacy that comes from a legal perspective and that is what they use to fuel themselves to say well let's let's boycott Israel Israel is a violator of human rights so instead of focusing on defending ourselves well Israel has great beaches Israel's democracy we know we've pulled that that doesn't work we have to focus on the offense on Islamists and how they violate the basic civil rights that liberals hold very, very dear. One of the things that we've done is we've created something called Voices for Justice. Voices for the number four, justice.com. And we are now working with student groups to host Islamist Apartheid Week on campuses because these students want to be involved. They want to feel important. They want to attach themselves to some sort of social justice movement. So if they want to be against apartheid, Let's give them what to be against. Let's give them to be against Islamist gender, race, and religious apartheid that is occurring in every single Muslim-majority country on the planet. So that's just a side note. So, so how do we then engage our lawyers to go on the offense and defeat the BDS movement? How do we defeat the unlawful discrimination against Jewish and Israeli companies? Well, first of all, we have to understand what is the law? What are our civil rights? And I can't tell you how many people are just simply unaware of what the First Amendment guarantees them. How student groups and government-funded schools have a guaranteed right under the First Amendment to put on pro-Israel events. And if there is a school that engages in any type of disruption or which coll uh, uh, coll colludes with groups like SJP or MSA, to stop that expression of free speech or freedom of assembly, that is a basic violation of the Constitution. You could sue the school for doing that. Students are unaware of what their Title VI 
rights are under federal law. Every student at a government-funded school is guaranteed an environment free of hostility and free of harassment. Schools like UCI and SFSU are ripe for a Title VI challenge. And yet when we go to the students, and I'm not going to name names here, but there are some so-called pro-Israel organizations, you just have to ask Natan Nessel who they are, who are actively engaging in discouraging students to speak to outsiders, effectively discouraging students to seek counsel to assert their basic civil rights. They are discouraging students to write and speak publicly about the anti-Semitism, the pervasive, hostile environment of anti-Semitism happening on campus. And when pro-Israel groups uh, publish statements saying anti-Semitism doesn't exist, how do you think that's going to play in a case where we bring a civil rights suit on behalf of the student alleging a hostile environment and the opponent enters into evidence a statement by I don't know, some pro-Israel organization saying, well, actually, the anti-Semitism isn't so bad. We do ourselves no favor by downplaying the anti-Semitism. So what are some of these successes that we've been able to have? Very often than not, I find that a simple lawyer's letter can do more damage, so to speak, than arranging 100,000 people marching up and down Broadway. You know waving Israeli flags. A lawyer's letter sends a message because people, I don't know if you've read the book 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene, the number one takeaway from that book is people act within their own best interests. So look what happened with Rutgers University, for example. Rutgers University was sponsoring U.S. to Gaza, Baca, Code Pink to fundraise for the flotilla movement. The community was outraged. People were protesting and the president said, you know, free speech, we have to allow them to come to campus. They came and, and fundraised, thousands of dollars were raised for the flotilla movement, and we were contacted by Rutgers Hillel, and we wrote a very friendly memo, a 72-page memo, to the president of Rutgers saying, I don't care what you think of Israel, but if you release those funds, you could spend up to 22 years in prison for material support for terrorism, and by the way, someone could potentially sue you as well as a terror victim for material support for Hamas. Why? Because Hamas is a designated terrorist group and any type of material aid, whether it be financial or legal or other, to a designated terrorist group is illegal in this country. It's also illegal in Europe. And when you take money and you give money to groups that have publicized that they were docking, they were have docking arrangements with Hamas, they had to organize with Hamas to dock their ships. When they publicized that they were going to deliver the materials on the boats to Hamas, and when they were stupid enough to put online a picture of them receiving a certificate from Hamas, thanking them for all of their help, that is a clear material support for terrorism case. Lo and behold, uh, the president of Rutgers did not release the money, and they were never invited back. Kuwait Airways. Kuwait Airways is an airline of the state of Kuwait, which is part of the Arab League boycott. The Arab League boycott is very well in a life. And we do ourselves no favor by just focusing on, on the BDS and calling it a grassroots movement. It is not. It is directed. It is inspired by the Arab League. There are laws. The Export Administration Act, for example, is unlawful to collude with a foreign entity to engage in a boycott of Israel. There are state anti-discrimination laws. New York State has a law that says it is unlawful to engage in any type of discrimination against a person because of race, ethnicity, ethnicity, national origin in a commercial context. Just like you can't have a bar that says no Mexicans allowed or no blacks allowed, so too you cannot have a co-op, you cannot have a company and say no Israeli products, no Israeli persons allowed. This is illegal. We have been able to defeat countless boycotts by simply working f in a very friendly manner with the in-house counsel of several corporations that have been targeted by the so-called BDS movement, warning them of the liability that would ensue should they engage in this type of commercially discriminatory behavior. Fast forward, Kuwait Airlines refuses to carry passengers who present an Israeli passport 
from JFK to London and also their inter-European flights. So we uh, submitted a brief with the Department of Transportation that ruled it was indeed a violation of the Export Administration Act for Kuwait Airways to operate over a decade in JFK and refuse to carry Israelis. We worked with the Port Authority, uh, who did a wonderful job, um, which is the landlord of JFK. And at a press conference, the Port Authority announced they were delivering as a landlord to their tenant a breach of lease letter, giving them 30 days to cure. Within those 30 days, we went to the airport with an Israeli passenger. We attempted to buy a ticket, and they canceled their flights from JFK to London because they hate Jews so much that they're willing to cancel a lucrative lev. And I actually heard that the business class in Kuwait Airways was quite nice. Uh, some people are mad at me for that. but. Look, that's how much they hate Jews, and we thought this was too easy, so we ended up engaging lawyers in Germany, we engaged lawyers in France, we engaged lawyers in Switzerland, we filed both a criminal and civil complaint in Switzerland, we again sent uh, an Israeli to buy a ticket, and just two weeks ago, Kuwait Airways uh, canceled all of their inter-European flights. That was a major defeat for the boycott movement. I don't want to take up too much time, but I'll also mention we have war crimes charges now being filed in Canada against the leaders of the Iranian state, against the Palestinian Authority, and against the leaders of Hamas. Why did we choose Canada? Because Canada has an extradition treaty with Europe. When the prosecutor approves the war crimes charge, it will trigger the Interpol arrest warrant, and we will use the same tactic against them that they used us. We are not afraid from, uh, of learning from them. We also have two cases in Italy, we have a hate speech case against a professor at the University of Genoa, together with our partners at the Solomon Project, also a legal entity that we work with there. And we also have a case that was just taken up by the Italian prosecution against a charitable front organization that was raising money for the PFLP, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. And now dovetailing into campus, because that's what our next speaker is going to talk about. When a Boston University student was targeted by his professor for his pro-Israel speech. He was harassed in school. He was denied approved testing accommodations because of his disability. We worked with that student and we provide counsel to lots of students to deal with the administration. Eventually that student's grade was expunged and that teacher is no longer teaching at Boston University. <laughs> When Daniel Vassal, a student at Temple University, was punched in the face by an SJP affiliate, we found three lawyers within 24 hours that worked with him that were retained pro bono. Pro bono, no fee. These lawyers ended up filing and getting criminal charges against the student. He had to issue a public apology, and he had hours and hours of community service. So this is just an example of what we can do if we empower the legal community. And I want to quickly just talk about SFSU and UCI, because I'm sure you have all heard about what happened to the mayor of Jerusalem, to Nir Barakat. It is absolutely essential that we empower our students to assert their civil rights. Lawyers groups are helpless. If we don't have a plaintiff, I can't do anything. The students at SFSU, where Nir Barkat was speaking, including the organization that sponsored the event, should be filing charges. They should be going to the police st uh, station and filing a report so we could pressure the DA to, to bring criminal charges against those students, just like was done for Michael Oren's speech at UC Irvine. Because the message that we send to our enemies, or even to the general community at large, is if we don't respect our own civil rights, why should they respect us? Look at what happened at UCI. You have false imprisonment there. You have a criminal misdemeanor. You have a violation of the California misdemeanor laws. You have a ripe Title VI case. And yet the students are intimidated to seek counsel. We have to come as a community, and we have to support them. Finally, the question is not what we can do to defeat BDS. The question is, what are we doing to enforce our basic civil rights? As Malcolm said, we have to create a movement. It has to be a legal movement. We must empower the lawyers in our community to assert our civil rights. Thank you so much. One of the concepts, one of the legal concepts we have is standing. Um, if somebody gets punched and I see them get punched, I can't advocate for them. They have to be willing to file a lawsuit. 
Israel has legal rights. It was guaranteed those rights, which are historical and biblical and inherent and so on, but it was guaranteed them in San Remo, in international treaties. They have rights under, under the WTO. And those rights are being violated. And yet the Israeli Ministry of Justice and Israeli officials are not taking up the mantle and not going to litigate those rights in the proper forms. You have rights under treaty law. The settlements, uh, the, the labeling of products from Judea and Samaria is illegal. The EU certification requirements are illegal. They are a violation of your rights under the WTO. The Israeli government has to stand up and litigate. We cannot do that for them. I just wanted to mention that. Why are we using the word Palestinian? There's no such thing as a Palestinian person. We use the word settlement. There's no such thing as settlements. They're Jewish homes. And I will give $100,000 to anyone in this room who could point me to the international law that says that Christians, Buddhists, Muslims are allowed to live in Judea and Samaria, but Jews are not. There's no such law. So we, right, we, use, we mistakenly use the word occupation, we mistakenly use the word settlements, and we always mistakenly use the word Palestinian. Let's call them Arabs. They're Arabs. The, I just want to mention one more thing, and then I'll, I'll get off. I, I, I forgot. The Israeli Ministry of, of Education right now, I don't know if anybody in the front row has any authority in the office, is currently unlawfully using textbooks provided by the Palestinian Authority to teach in Arab language schools funded by the Israeli government. It is a violation of the law. It is a basic violation of the human rights of innocent Muslim children who go to school, who are being taught from textbooks funded by Israeli taxpayers teaching them to kill Jews. I know that there's an organization, Center for Near East Policy Research, David Bedin. I co-sponsored a film with them called Camp Jihad. It was featured on Fox News with Megyn Kelly. It's, he's fantastic. I don't understand why the Israeli Ministry of Education is allowing this to happen. It is illegal. We are complicit in our own demise, as usual, as is historically the case.